Welcome to GWNet's first knowledge transfer webinar for the LAC and MENA Regional Mentoring Program, which is also the official launch of GWNet's brand new study, Women for Sustainable Energy Strategies to Foster Women's Talent for Transformational Change. If you now don't recognize the title, it was previously titled Women in, Sust in the Sustainable Energy Sector, Strategies for Diversity Inclusion. We've just recently changed the title. Um, my name is Irina Gaubinger. I am a project manager with GWNet and the moderator of today's webinar, which will be led by GWNet's president, Dr. Irene Gina Reichel, who will give uh, a presentation on the findings of the study. The presentation will last approximately 30 minutes and the remaining time is reserved for discussion. I'm happy to see so many participants from the LAC and MENA mentoring program and beyond from our members and other participants, which I think is a very nice mix for a fruitful exchange after the presentation. Now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Irene Gina Reichel. She is an Austrian career diplomat with long-standing expertise in sustainable development, women's rights, development policy, and energy. She currently is Austrian ambassador in Brazil and Suriname. And before that, she was director general for Austria's development policy and Austrian ambassador to the People's Republic of China and Mongolia. Irene has published widely on international relations and global issues. She is the president of the Global Forum of Sustainable Energy Vice President of REN21 and President of the Global Women's Network of the Energy Transition. Irene, thank you for being with us today and for making yourself available to give this presentation. Um, without any further delay, I would like to give the floor to you. Thank you. See how to share the presentation. Can you hear me? Irene, yes, now we can hear you. Okay, very good. Uh, there's something, something doesn't seem to be working properly, but if you can hear me now, we can, we can start. Sure, mm -hmm. please go ahead, Irene. Very good. Well, thank you, uh, first of all, for um, the interest in this uh, study. Uh, today is, is a very interesting um, uh, time uh, because, as you might have heard, the World Economic Forum has just uh, presented its uh, annual uh, gender gap report. And according to this gender gap report, uh, we have again a situation where we will have to wait for about more than 100 years before gender parity actually uh, will uh, happen. And this, of course, is a uh, a very uh, discomforting situation. So uh, we, we are thinking at the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition that actually the area of sustainable development could be one of the, of the areas uh, and sustainable energy in it where we really try to accelerate progress and um, to move forward uh, with the uh, not just necessary energy transition, but also with the social transformations. So, so if we look uh, briefly at um, uh, what uh, the Global Women's Network is and is doing, uh, you, you are quite aware of that already. It is uh, networking, it is connecting women, it is doing advocacy and services, and, um, and therefore, um, uh, you are also already involved in mentoring, coaching, 
and other activities. The uh, study that we have uh, in mind is uh, uh, based on a report prepared by Anna Boyd, Dr. Anne-Marie Nobelius and uh, Ms. Sarah Stans, an international team of women that has worked on gender issues for a very long time. And uh, uh, the report was then uh, tailored to the needs of the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition by Irina, Christina, Linz, and, and myself. Uh, the report has um, uh, basically three steps, uh, if you wish, of analysis. Uh, one is to review the scientific evidence. The second one is industry interviews. Um, and the third one is what they call a structural environmental analysis. I hear some echo, but can you understand me clearly? Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Then, then we will, will continue. The, the question um, that we wanted to address in this um, um, study uh, mainly was the question, what can we do to increase women's employment in the sustainable energy sector in the future? So, you know, it's not about all issues related to energy and gender. It's, it's really quite specifically about employment in the sustainable energy sector. Uh, and since we cannot look at all the employment situations in the world in one short study, uh, we are fo focusing in this report mainly, not exclusively, but mainly on corporate settings. So when we take a look um, at what the situation is today, we see that the situation is pretty uh, dire. When we look at utilities, for example, we will only have 5% of the board executives and 16% uh, of the board members of the top 200 utilities uh, being women. Uh, there is um, uh, a discrepancy between conventional energy and renewables. There is a bit of a better situation in renewables, but again, when we break down uh, and look at what are the more technical uh, employments in um, renewables, uh, in the so-called STEM areas, science, technology, engineering, and um, mathematics, then we see uh, again uh, the, the usual drop in the female presentation. Now, why are we worried about uh, this situation? First of all, because it is a question of justice. It's a question of uh, human rights of women, human rights of women which are integral parts of the human rights in general, and women have the right to have access to whatever they seek access to. You know, they certainly have access to, uh, have a right to access to employment and a an, uh, right to access to employment on equal conditions uh, with men. And this situation is all the more uh, important since we, ex we, we expect the workforce in sustainable energy to grow. Currently, according to estimates of IRENA, we are roughly at about 11 million people worldwide employed in renewable energy. But we expect this workforce to grow to something like 42 million by the year 2050. And uh, we do not want to uh, continue this uh, discrepancy. So, um, can we have the next slide, please? Yes, very good. So, what the study da did is, um, first of all, try to look at um, 
the data that we have, data about women participation. And there we see that the data already are not so secure. Uh, we have, for example, uh, a EU study which uh, tells us that there are about 11% of women who study STEM in the EU and there are 35% in the renewable energy sector. India has a very good um, percentage of female students in STEM. Australia uh, has some uh, figures on women company directors and in the electricity supply sector. South Africa has other data. And, and the, the, the issue is that the data are not uh, very easy to compare and the methodologies vary, the study boundaries vary. So uh, one of the issues that the study uh, wants to highlight is that in order to change a situation that we know is not uh, satisfactory, we really have to get better data on what exactly the situation is uh, in order to also address uh, any, any shortcomings uh, uh, in a very targeted way. So, um, if we then go on to looking at uh, this uh, uh, chart, uh, we, we can say that there is um, the representation of women across industries. And this is data taken from the United States from uh, uh, McKinsey. McKinsey was looking at um, representation of women across a, a relatively broad variety of, um, of sectors from asset management to banking, to consumer, to packaged good, um, et cetera. And um, what came out of this um, uh, what came out of this uh, uh, study was that there is no real global evidence that one sector does much better than others, which uh, if we um, if we transform this insight to the sustainable energy sector, we can also also say well um, so the same sector is not doing so much worse than other sectors. But uh, regardless of the industry, there are some companies in all kinds of sectors that are doing better than others and that are standing uh, out. And it is to those companies or to those subsectors that we want to um, direct our attention to see what they are doing, how they are doing things so that actually uh, they are achieving greater uh, representation of women in, in, their, in their respective uh, companies. Now, one thing that stands out if we look at all of these different sectors, and you see it very well in the, in the, in the chart, in the drawing of the chart, uh, women uh, leadership, uh, participation decreases with seniority. And this is also, you know, something that we have seen for a long time and it's also something that uh, we, we have to uh, uh, connect to the argument that says, well, we will address the gender imbalance by education. Women by now are very educated, thanks God. They have they have excellent skills and they have excellent degrees and they are hired um, at, at, in the initial phases also, um, uh, uh, you know, almost at parity with men in some areas uh, better than, than men. But what happens as they, as they grow in seniority in the company settings, they thin out. And it's, it's the same uh, kind of contri attrition that uh, happens that um, yeah, across, all, across all the sectors. So this is one of the 
uh, one of the clear structural problems that we have that women, even though they are hired because of their qualifications, because of their excellent skills, um, as, as, the, uh, as they move up to more senior positions, they uh, lose out uh, significantly against uh, men. Now, this is a situation that is all the more strange if we look at the power of gender equality. And uh, this is the next uh, slide. Irina, if you could give us the next slide. The next slide is the power of gender equality. We have by now many studies that were done by uh, consultancies like McKinsey, but also by the World Bank uh, or by uh, the, the World Economic Forum that I mentioned initially, and by many other um, entities and institutions which come from north and south and uh, uh, cover a, a broad uh, spectrum of ideologies. And in all these studies, it comes out that diversity, uh, diversity of talent is a very important issue, not just because of human rights, but also because uh, it is an issue of increasing your bottom line and increasing the overall services that companies can provide and also uh, to improve uh, social uh, development issues in, in a variety of contexts. Uh, when we, for example, uh, look at uh, the global uh, domestic product, there are calculations, of course, these calculations are uh, done uh, uh, in, in, in office settings and the real world may be a little different. But still, if all the countries were reaching gender equality by the year 2025, 28 trillion US dollars per annum would be added to the global economy. And if all the countries only reached the level of gender parity that the best country in their group, in their regional group has, even then um, 12 US um, dollar trillion per annum would be added to the global economy. So in other words, uh, it's good for the economy uh, at, the, at the macro level. It's also good for the, for the economic results of companies at the micro levels. There are uh, very convincing studies that show that women in leadership positions, in corporate boards, etc., uh, lead their companies in such a way that the companies are better prepared to survive financial shock. They have an improved profitability. They have increased innovation, investment, and R&D. And um, uh, also, these, these uh, women directors influence the leadership of the companies in such a way that there is less overconfidence, therefore also less unnecessary risk taking. Um, there is often more action on environmental issues, therefore less litigation because of environmental breaches. There are more stringent uh, uh, decarbonization um, policies, etc. So if um, the evidence is so compelling that it is actually good for business, uh, to have uh, women in leadership positions. Why then are there so uh, few uh, leadership uh, positions filled by women? And um, you may all uh, know the musical song, Why Can't a Woman Be More Like a Man from My Fair Lady? Well, this is part of the problem that the businesses are still couched in a, in, a, in a masculine culture. That's the history of businesses. And often they are a bad fit for women. And they are also a bad fit for men 
who don't fall into the classic categories, uh, you know, defined of what it means to be a man uh, 50 years ago in the industrial in the industrial setting. There are still many gender perceptions that that operate at the very insidious uh, and and uh, almost subconscious uh, level. You know, you may see this little girl's brick set uh, that uh, you can buy as a gift for 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 a, for a young child, and it it already, even though it pretends to be a brick set. So bricks is what boys use. Even in that brick set, you have some gender bias um, enshrined. The woman, uh, the, the little girl, sits alone at home. She, she drinks a glass of wine. She waits for, obviously, for her husband to come home to her kitchen and eat the meal that she has prepared lovingly in her bricks kitchen. So these negative perceptions about what women should be doing and also what women are able to do have a bad impact on women's uh, self-confidence and uh, uh, this, uh, this impact on self-confidence then often leads women to even perpetuating uh, some of the gender bias really that, uh, uh, that we see. And this cultural bias is often explained as natural that's just how things are. Men are like this, and women are like this. But we all know from gender studies that uh, gender, the understanding of how a society uh, relates to what it means to be a man, to what it be a woman, etc., that these are really social constructions and, uh, and they change over time. And therefore, they can continue to change um, and uh, allow women to take uh, their uh, places in uh, sustainable energy just uh, alongside uh, uh, men. The energy, the energy transition, the way we looked at this um, uh, uh, slide. Can we please have the next slide, Irina? The energy transition is uh, a big thing. It's not just about changing coal and uh, replacing it by renewable energy uh, sources. It's not just about increasing energy efficiency. It's really changing um, a lot of things around uh, in terms of energy production, energy uh, distribution, in terms of patterns of production and consumption. And really, it, 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 is, it, it is an endeavor to change the very fabric of our societies. And um, since it is such a radical reform, um, it has also the potential to um, uh, change some very ingrained patterns such as the interaction between uh, women and men around uh, gender issues. And uh, it allows also to envision, envision societies that are constructed in a much more inclusive and participatory way. Energy, uh, the energy transi transition in our view has uh, the potential to change uh, the overall fabric of society. And uh, we at the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition, we would like that uh, change of society be towards greater inclusivity and greater diversity, uh, better participation of women and men, but really of, of more inclusiveness towards all kinds of talents and uh, uh, backgrounds, skills, etc., life experiences. Now, if you recall um, uh, the initial one of the initial slides where we said how the study is built up in different steps, one of the steps was that the authors of the study conducted interview themes. 
And these are some of the themes that recurred um, uh, during the, the interviews. Uh, the interviews were done uh, in an ex exemplary fashion. So not enough interviews were done to, to draw any statistical uh, results from it. But uh, um, it was still a broad range of uh, um, interviews, 34 interviews, um, that, uh, that allowed from different you know, from women and a few men from different uh, backgrounds, countries, regions, um, in sustainable energy. So the interviews, by and large, um, reconfirmed what was already known through the study of existing research because the study obviously also draws significantly on existing research in the area of, um, of gender studies and as it applies to sustainable energy. So what came out in the interviews time and time again was that there was actually little understanding of the very concept of gender among the, the sustainable energy professions. Uh, there was uh, a prevalence of traditional gender roles. Um, there was the experience of masculine dominance. There was the experience that women related that they have to work harder, that extra expectation is placed on them. Um, there was also, um, you know, the insight that sometimes women can be more motivated by values the men, not always, but sometimes. There, are, uh, there was also the heartening insight that actually generational change is happening and that the younger workforce has uh, a different approach to gender uh, relationships. Uh, we, there was also quite a, a gap that was reported time and again that policy and practice and implementation, you know, are quite uh, far apart. There was general agreement that flexible and supportive working conditions are um, of the essence. And that it is often difficult to understand the gender dynamics in the workplace and not to be caught up by it. Now, I think uh, we will flash you quickly some of the quotes from the interview themes. I'm not uh, going to comment on them because they speak for themselves and they just give you a flavor of what um, happened in the interview. Little understanding of gender. Now we can move on to generational change traditional gender roles. If we take a more, yeah, let you read this. And then the next slide um, tries to systematize a little bit um, some of the findings in the interviews. And um, it was clear that there are differences um, depending on whether they, we look at the old type centralized um, energy situations or whether we look at decentralized smaller off-grid rural projects etc. There, there are uh, differences and some of the differences work for women and some work against women in both uh, sectors. The centralized energy projects often um, uh, or, or, or energy situations of, often involve larger projects. They are more corporate. Uh, they, they also have more um, compliance rules, um, et cetera. And, and uh, they also offer employment opportunities for women also in traditional roles. The decentralized off-grid rural projects, often there are smaller teams that are male-dominated, 
um, and there is uh, a lot of travel and on-site work uh, needed, which is often hard for women to do. On the other side, from my own experience as a Director General for Development Cooperation of Austria, I know that some of the most amazing progress was made by women-led teams in rural off-grid situations where energy of access uh, had to be brought to the villages. So uh, the picture is not very uniform and one has to take close looks to actually um, see what can work and what cannot work. If you look at some of the strategies that the um, authors saw for increasing inclusion, we have the issue of quotas. Quotas, of course, are controversial. And often women themselves say, oh, I don't want any quotas. I want to be hired on my own merit. There is a lot of evidence, though, that quotas do work in certain settings under certain circumstances. And, and the merit argument often um, has been disproven also because very meritorious women are not hired and quotas don't lead to the hiring of women without merit either. So quotas need to be looked at carefully. Second strategy for increasing inclusion is, of course, to attract more women and girls to STEM early on. Third big area is recruitment practices. You know, take a close look at how recruitment actually occurs. Uh, are the job descriptions inclusive? Is there uh, gender neutral advertisement language? How do the selection panels look like? Are there all male or is there diversity in the selection panels? Is there a requirement to have a, a, device, a diversified shortlist, etc.? What needs to be happen in recruitment practices needs to happen in workplace strategies uh, later on as well from performance reviews to employee-led diversity and inclusion programs and zero, to zero tolerance on sexual harassment. The study looks at various examples that have worked and provide good uh, food for thought of what could be replicated. Of course, it is important also to have more women in senior decision-making roles. And we have to have increased transparency and accountability. There are any number of existing resources and toolkits already on increasing uh, uh, gender balance and uh, enhancing inclusivity. So they can all be used and adapted to the needs of the sustainable energy sector. And it is important to support coalitions of the willing because like any change, there is resistance to change. And there will be some that are the first movers and some that, uh, that uh, really take this issue forward and um, any support they can get um, should be uh, given to them. When we look at the specificities of the sustainable energy sector, because what we said before about this, the strategies, they were, the, those strategies applied to more or less all um, economic sectors. But sustainable energy perhaps has a few specificities. And the specificities have to do that it's a relatively young sector. So, new habits can be built. It's not necessary to continue old bad habits. There is also um, a clear talent shortage in the sector. So businesses should go and look at talent wherever they can find it. 
And this is one of the, the, the main arguments of the World Economic Forum gender gap report, that uh, the, the absence of female talent robs the industry of um, resources that are very, very badly needed to actually accelerate the energy transition. And this acceleration is of the essence because if we continue with business as usual, you know, we will never uh, be able to address the challenges that humanity faces, which is climate change, extreme poverty, and other uh, such global issues, for which the energy transition provides a key solution, not the only solution, but a key solution among many others. Sustainable energy also has um, a green and value-driven reputation, which uh, may speak more to uh, women. Uh, there is the opportunity of creating more productive and innovative for workforces that can also show the way and open up avenues for other sectors. And since it is a new sector, there is the chance also of building up um, the work conditions that are actually good for women and men, for families and for the communities. Because the old industrial uh, work division type of model actually may not be adequate anymore anyway for the needs of women and men, their families and their communities. So there are many um, uh, recommendations that came out to make the sustainable energy sector more inclusive that came out of the work of the study. And really, we don't have the time to go into all of these in detail. And we also want you to read the study once it is published um, from A to Z. So I don't want to give everything away in this presentation. But clearly, you see how far reaching the recommendations are. And I let you just uh, read those uh, um, colored uh, bars by your set. There are more when we break it open a bit more. So it starts from gender policy and implementation of gender policy to workshops, trainings, mentor programs, uh, and uh, many other uh, steps that can be taken by various actors of the sustainable energy sector. And there are many case studies or examples, let's put it uh, there, in the study that give meat uh, and potatoes to these recommendations. The study then uh, really ends with some recommendation addressed to various stakeholders. Some stakeholders are addressed to ourselves, such as avoiding gender stereotyping and attempting to challenge implicit bias wherever we find it. That can be done in very uh, informal ways, and these informal ways often are very effective. But of course, in order to do that, it's important to be aware of our day-to-day -day interactions the language we use. And if we are in managerial positions, which many of us are, you know, we can make it a point of supporting and promoting competent individuals while aiming for it. There is a word to companies and organizations. Companies need to commit to long-term transformation and diversity from the top down. 
they have to have strategies and implement them. They can use the many tools available and support employee-led initiatives. They should support coalitions of the willing and engage with educational institutions for pipeline development uh, uh, and um, training projects uh, early on. There is a word to educational institutes. There is a word to governments, of course. Governments need to set the frameworks, the legal frameworks in which gender equality can thrive. And there are many ways governments have done that already and can do it even better. It is not a coincidence that the Nordic countries of Europe usually fare well, uh, fare better on gender parity statistics than other countries. But also countries such as Rwanda or um, other developing countries, countries in the so-called uh, global south, um, have shown that by taking targeted uh, legislative action, the gender balance situation can be improved very significantly. So governments have a role to play. And intergovernmental bodies and NGOs also have a role to play. There are many networks of women already, and the list uh, will give uh, the, the study will give a few examples of these uh, networks. Of course, the global, global Women's Network for the Energy Transition is uh, one of uh, these networks. And actually, we aim at uh, providing platforms for many of these um, smaller and more regional um, networks so that the issue of network, networking among women uh, in sustainable energy can be brought to a new level. Uh, I believe that the Women in Energy Expert Platform that you probably are quite aware of is um, a very good place to start if you want yourself to um, network more and by doing that, encourage each other uh, to move ahead, to go for what uh, you are dreaming about, to go for what you are passionate about, and uh, to be uh, one important player in this energy transition, which needs to become more female and more inclusive in order to become also faster and uh, uh, deliver the results that we needed to deliver, which is really social development for all and the development in, within the boundaries of the carrying capacity of the earth. With that, I hope I have whetted your appetite for the study and I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Irene, for the comprehensive presentation. I would now like to open the floor for discussion and also for sharing of your personal experiences being in the sector. And you can do that by either using the chat function of Zoom or you can unmute your microphone, uh, state your name and organization um, and pose your question. Please, who would like to go first? Oh, there is a question actually when the study will be launched. So the uh, entire study document will be made available in January and we will keep you posted on that. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. This is Sara from Mexico. Um, I don't know if you can hear me okay. It's fine, thank you. Okay. Um, my question is about the study is how or even if you have taken into account the age uh, of the people that you have interviewed, 
in the sense, uh, like taking into account the age uh, as a variable uh, for the experience in the, in the field of women. Um, this is because I find it um, particularly uh, interesting that sometimes uh, the age uh, plays on your favor particularly when you are just starting your career as an engineer or any other uh, profession within the STEM field. Um, but then at some point, uh, this becomes like a, like a disadvantage for you. And um, in Mexico, for example, sometimes when you are starting your career, it's okay for you to not have a family because then you can uh, have uh, jobs more easily but at some point when you are uh, older if you don't have a family you get kind of excluded of some of some uh, executive or directive positions because they see they see the family as a way of you to be responsible you know so it's kind of like a, it's a it's a weird thing I don't know if it happens globally but at least in Mexico, it's something that it has happened to me that sometimes I don't get the job because I don't have kids and I don't plan to have them. And then see that, uh, they, they see that as an unreliable, unreliable factor for me because then they think I will, I will go whenever I, I, I can, you know. So mm -hmm. I don't know how the factor of age has been taken into account uh, in, in the study. Uh, or if it has been, I know that it's a yeah. very short approach right now. Yes. But yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. No. The, the 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 this age factor is a very important uh, uh, issue. The the interviews, as I said, were conducted only with some thirty-five or so people. So it's it's exemplary interviews and not statistically relevant. But uh, throughout the study, the issue of competition ability between family obligations and work obligations comes up. And it is clear that one of the keys for uh, enabling more, more women to participate in sustainable energy is to make work conditions um, uh, compatible with, uh, with family obligations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Then we have a question from Imen, if we have any data about women entrepreneurs, company owners or startups in the energy sector? Uh, we, it, it, this study did not focus so specifically about uh, entrepreneurship. We are uh, going to uh, do something about, about entrepreneurship though as the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition. And I think Irina, since you are coordinating um, that uh, work stream also, perhaps you want to inform a little bit about that. Yes, so we, what we are doing is not that we are collecting data in itself, uh, in, in, uh, over, oh, but, but we have been in touch with uh, women entrepreneurs globally to interview them on their personal career path, on the challenges, on the opportunities that they experience along the, their, their personal uh, uh, career. So it is a very um, yeah, individual collection of, 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 of interesting women in the sustainable energy sector, of entrepreneurs in the en sustainable energy sector, which will go online also in January. Hi. Hello, Khalud. Hi, I am Khalud from Tunisia. And I have a question. Actually, according to the female leadership crisis, uh, women leave leadership jobs four times more than men. That means that women abandon uh, the ship before they have a chance to be seriously considered. So I want to know when interviewing these women, what, uh, what type of support they said they need uh, to have and um, when they have a leadership position? Maybe because uh, they are not prepared for this leadership position or maybe uh, the lack of support from their peers and managers. Did you have some uh, answers to uh, this question, please? How yes. Yeah. Yes. Why do they leave leadership position? 
Yeah, there, I mean, I think there's, there's a, a couple of uh, things that, that come out of the interviews. Um, one is what I already said, that it's very hard uh, at some points to reconciliate uh, responsibilities in the family and responsibilities in the job. But then there are also the expectations that uh, um, uh, women are confronted with. There is one story related in the, in the study where a woman and a man, both professionals um, in the field, participate in a, in a fair, in an exhibition, yeah, in, a, in a trade fair. And uh, uh, while the, the, the man is, is never confronted really with questions about the family, the, the woman is constantly asked things like, so who is looking after your kids while you are here at the fair? So who is, who is uh, taking care of your parents while you're here? These kinds of questions. And at some point, um, that particular woman related that she felt, you know, she really must be a bad uh, family person because she's, ne she's negligent about her, her family. And she was discouraged in her professional endeavor. So these are some of the, of the things that uh, people do to each other. It's not even a structure of a, a corporation that discriminates against that woman. No, she was a, she was a professional in her, own, in her own right and sent there by, the, by her company. An example. But I think uh, the, the support that is needed for women uh, to, to actually stay on the ship uh, until they reach uh, leadership positions is twofold. One, it's to create working conditions that are compatible with, with uh, uh, family obligations. And that's true for men also. Men also have family obligations and should take care of them. But the second thing is really to have targeted mentoring, coaching, training programs directed at women to really overcome uh, the structural uh, disadvantages that women have been exposed to in, in practically all countries. Yes. Okay. And personally, I think, sorry, if I just add this, personally, I think it helps if there are um, rules on, on, on quota or on composition. So, yeah. you know, that you have to have uh, on a short list, you cannot have a short list only with men. You cannot have a panel in any conference only with men. You cannot have um, uh, what have you, you know, a, a, um, a selection board only uh, consisting of men. So in all, these, in all these instances, there has to be diversity and that already helps, um, helps uh, encourage women. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking at... Sorry, go ahead. Pia? Yes, this is Pia from uh, Richard. Um, I would like to add on, on the comment on papers. Sorry, Pia, I think we can't hear you well, really. Can you speak a bit closer to the, into the microphone? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, very well. Um, I just want to make a comment, and that is on, on quotas. I think it is very important to have quotas in place because they really push companies to implement measurements that will better allow an alignment between people and family. Because yes. they will have to increase um, the amount of women simply, right? And just if companies have, you know, good plans in place for women, family, and men to take care of family, um, I think it's really important. I think that's a difficult obstacle of you know women being identified as the only person to be responsible women, but this is not the case. And just if uh, peop, uh, women will be increased, the amount of women in, in jobs will be increased, um, well, also men will be more forced to take care of family issues, then it will become you know, more natural that there is uh, an equal share. 
Yes, and the, there are there were recommendations. There are clear recommendations in the study also that uh, diversity policies are good for men also. <laughs> you know, it's uh, because it's not it's uh, it's not uh, something that we want to do for women also, only, but um, uh, workplace frameworks. Uh, workplace conditions should be such that women and men can uh, have family responsibilities and work re responsibilities. And so that includes issues like a parental leave, that includes policies for making the re-entry uh, smoother after taking a leave uh, for family reasons, um, things like that. F fully agreed, fully agreed. And I think women should not be afraid of asking for quotas. And I think we should, you know, we should not be afraid and we should not be ashamed because as you said, it is our good right, right? To be in the, in the, in the workplace. Um, and as you also correctly say, it brings advantages to the male population too. And uh, yes. well, if the male population is not pushing for these things, at least we should be, and uh, we really should not be ashamed or frightened or whatever. So thank you very much for yes. pointing that out. Absolutely. Hi, uh, I have a question. Uh, Hello, yes, can you speak, please speak up? Yeah, uh, hi, uh, my name is Mary Jones. Um, I'm basically from oil and gas industry. So I was in oil and gas for 15 years and now moved to renewables. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so um, my question is, I mean, uh, I'm very glad. I'm very happy to see the presentation. And um, basically a few points that struck my mind is um, regarding um, regarding uh, bringing people, uh, female or um, girls to the STEM field. Uh, the ad ads that you pointed out, like um, um, masculine uh, job, you showed in 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 form of uh, feminine uh, features. That's a good one. Yeah, I have another question. Uh, the question is mainly uh, related to corporates and uh, also the the, ad, the value that you've shown um, for the females to come up to the to the ladder and to the executives. Is one of the value. Uh, one of the point is regarding the value. So because uh, women always uh, try to uh, find out to bring up values, that is an added value. Uh, but uh, my question is, uh, being in a corporate and being a female, is uh, the female um, mostly point out values? Is that a, a negative also in terms of uh, bringing women up to the ladder? Because they bring up uh, a lot of value. So sometimes it conflicts with strategy and sure. uh, strategy sure. and values. Yeah. Sure, so, that can be that can be the case. That can be the case. But the study also has found that the renewable energy sector or the, the energy transi transition uh, workplaces tend to att attract uh, people that are actually interested, not just in the bottom line, but also about social justice, environmental justice, etc. I mean, you know, all these, uh, all these uh, generalizations are generalizations and they have to be taken with a grain of salt. I know many men, which I respect uh, a lot and which uh, are very value oriented. So, you know, it, it, it's not, it, it should not be construed as an issue. Women are value oriented, men, men are not. I think that's not, uh, it's not. Yeah, uh, basically, like I have, I have struggled all the way through like 15 years to be in the male oriented in the offshore oil and gas field. Um, so um, I, I've gone through everything. With, like I had family, children, everything, but I, I struggled to come up to the ladder and I was about to reach the top. I mean, they have given you even training, the leadership program, everything is successfully done. Uh, but um, like, like a pilot uh, project, they were trying to um, uh, do the, the leadership role, like pilot. So during that time, itself, I took a value, like I want to bring more work to the local community, I mean, the local um, mm -hmm. entity of the corporate. And uh, it is more added value to the 
for uh, the company i mean in terms of strategy it is it, it gave more value because it's uh, more com- competitive and good quality stuff but uh, because of the corporate strategy i mean uh, i wasn't successful but um, i left the job but um, during my send off day i mean i could talk to all all my 60 engineers and uh, my staff and um, uh, but uh, They, but um, the glad thing is that I I I tell I told them that I struggled to do, do bring good job to you guys. So, but um, but that is not in that is not in my pocket. It's of the corporate strategy. Uh, but uh, okay, now the successor or the the new head will take you further. So, uh, but I'm so glad that I was I was um, I was uh, able to. I was trying to bring them a good a job. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, but yeah. then, uh, yeah, I couldn't reach up to the the corporate uh, because of because I tried to uh, stick to the value to bring uh, mm. the job. To the Congratulations people. for doing that. Congratulations yeah. for doing that. You know, yeah. we 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 all have to try, and we we are not always successful. But the more the more we try, the the more will happen. Yeah, so I have I have the, the people still with me because I mean, they they always consider that because I mm-hmm. I stood up for them, but uh, mm-hmm. it was not the corporate strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that, Mary. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we're already uh yeah already running over time, but uh, yeah. is there maybe yeah. we would like to take one more question and then finish off all the other questions that have been posted. I I don't see that there's an immediate response right now but please stay tuned for the for the final study and if the questions remain uh, stay in touch with us. <laughs> so who else was here for the last question? Okay, if there's no one no who as well. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much for for uh for uh, for being uh, um at this um, at this meeting point in cyberspace and um it's very impressive to see so many uh on the screen and uh, and hear your questions and yeah good luck for what you're doing let's uh, keep in touch hopefully the study when it will come out in january in full will inspire you and uh, uh, we also love to hear your feedback when you when you read the study because obviously this is not a one time effort this is a, a a path that we have to walk together and that we from the global women's network for the energy transition very much want to walk together with you all thank you very much thank you bye bye thank you bye bye thank, thank you, you. Thank you.